Right, so let's get straight into the code. So within the context of interoperability between managed and unmanaged code bases, it's somewhat likely you're probably going to be using a front-end framework like WPF or UWP or Windows Forms application, um, and you want to access some kind of low-level functionality um, you know, that you wouldn't usually be able to um, access within a managed environment. So what I'm going to do, or what I've already done rather, is I've gone ahead and I have here a UWP application. So you can go ahead and um, you can follow along with UWP or you can use WPF. Uh, I think it should be okay. But for this particular uh, scenario, I'm using UWP. Don't quote me on that though. I'm not too sure about WPF. I've not tested it on that. And the articles I found usually refer to UWP interrupting with the Windows RT. So um, just maybe double check. I'll leave some links in the description with some useful documentation just in case. Anyway, let's proceed with the video. So first things first, I'm just gonna adjust my setup a little bit. Actually, let's stay here. So I have a function here called get time. And this functionality, it calls some square RT um, class one member in a square RT namespace. And um, we've gone ahead and given this variable. Let me just unhighlight that. It's a bit hard to read for me. Uh, time class. And we've gone and instantiated this class one um, class. And we're calling a tick function. Now, the thing is, there is no, um, obviously, it's within the scope of the square RT namespace, and that's where class one is. I was going to say there is no class one um, directly uh, visible in this um, solution directory, but that's because we have here a, a namespace to our runtime code base, and it has within within the runtime code base, there's a class called class one, and we've made an instance of that class, and we've gone ahead and called one of its functions called tick. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch my windows so that you may be able to see another Visual Studio instance. And here I have a, um, a WinRTC++ um, project template. Now, I'm hoping that this can load considerably quickly because my computer is pretty slow. I want to just show you how the template looks just in case you're wondering uh, where it is. So you can go ahead and load uh, an instance of Visual Studio. I'm using 2019 edition, <coughs> excuse me, 2019 version uh, with the community edition. And once this is loaded, the um, create a new project template loader, uh, I'm just going to wait a few seconds, uh, should come any moment now. Excellent. So now that the template manager is here, what we're going to do, um, I'm going to actually, oh, I've already filtered it to C++, uh, Windows, and uh, UWP. So what's interesting is that you can actually create a universal Windows blank application um, based on either C++ or C Sharp. Now, um, in the interest in this video of showing the interoperability between a managed code base and unmanaged, uh, I'm going ahead with the C Sharp project template. And it's not showing up here because I thought it's C++. So we're going to go ahead and try and look for the Windows Runtime component. And this is what you want. You want the Windows Runtime component for Universal Windows C++. And this is a project for a Windows Runtime component that can be used by a Universal Windows Platform app, regardless of the programming language in which the app is written in. In which the app is written. <laughs> so now this is quite important. So therein here lies... Uh, the prowess of utilizing this project anywhere. Now, you don't have to worry too much about this void tick. I was just kind of experimenting with things. Um, but what we're really interested in is what I'm going to uh, run you through now. So once you have your blank uh, Windows Runtime Component project type, one of the first things you want to do is to um, highlight your project, or rather right-click your project in the Solution Explorer, go to Add, and then you want to add a new item. And we're going to be adding an IDL file. So I'm going to wait for the manager to come up. Um, let's see if I can make this a little bigger. It doesn't really change the text, unfortunately. I could change the view on OBS. I'll do that in a second. So we're going to go to data. The data, um, oh, is it? It's not data. So I think it's code. Sorry about that. So here it is. So under code, I'm going to go ahead and maximize the screen just a little bit so you can see a lot better. Um, so what I have here are some imports. Um, basically, I was following uh, another very helpful tutorial which helped me get through this. 
Uh, I will link it. Uh, it's from a credible source. Uh, basically, have this format in terms of your imports. And um, we have the namespace here. And now what we do, I'm declaring here a runtime class called get current time. And um, you want to set these attributes, version one. And this UUID is, it's a unique identifier for your particular machine. And I will again leave a link in the description or I will describe it in the description how to get your own UUID. Let's just call it UID for now. Um, you basically go into the administrator command prompt, um, slash command prompt, and you can get it from there. I'll leave the syntax in the description. But you're going to need that for this part. Um, place that in this, um, pass it um, as the UID. And now we want to define an interface. I went ahead and called it I get current time. So we're going to go ahead and create an interface. Um, I defined it as I get current time and it accesses, um, uh, inherits from I inspectable. So we're going to need that. Um, we also have here a function which is defined as get current time, which has to match your defined runtime class here of get current time case. I have in my class one CPP a really, really simple functionality. I'll leave a link in the description if I can hopefully find, because this example I found, uh, I found online, it's open source as, as far as I can tell, as far as the definition goes. So uh, should be fine to, to just link you to it. It's a Google search away. Complexity of your CPP logic. Uh, obviously your code base is gonna vary to this. This is just a, a very simple example of a, of a very simple C++ uh, functionality. Good measure, build your UWP application as well. As you can see here, I have, a, I have the square RT DLL. And uh, what we're gonna do uh, is go and hover over the UWP um, project, uh, as you can see in the Solution Explorer. We're gonna go ahead and go to uh, add. Uh, and we're gonna go ahead and go to add reference. Now, what you wanna do is hit browse. I'm on browse now. I'm gonna hit browse at the bottom there. And at the um, debug directory of your Windows runtime component, after you built it, you should have access to this, your project name folder, debug, and then again, your project name folder. And inside of it, there should there's a few files here, but what we're interested in is actually the DLL of your project. So in this case, it's called square RT, square runtime dot DLL. And I'm not gonna add it again. Actually, I will, I'll, let me see. Is it showing up? No, it's, it's not. So I'm gonna add it again, just so you can see how it looks. It pops up here, as you can hopefully make out, and uh, you just make sure it's ticked and then you hit OK. I've already done so, so I'm not going to do that again. And what that does is that now you've added a reference to your Windows Runtime component, you can access its functionality uh, in your UWP application. Um, so what it is, now you can use, depending on the nature of your functionality in your Windows component runtime, you're going to be calling different kinds of functions. So in this case, what I did is I, in the constructor of my main window um, class, <coughs> excuse me, I'm calling get time and get time is a simple function, which calls the square RT um, namespace and it calls class one. If you recall, class one is a class, a CPP file in the square RT Windows runtime component. Sorry, my mind went blank a little bit there. And we're instantiating it. And then we're actually calling tick. Uh, I did make a little mistake saying that we're not utilizing tick, um, but we are. And I'm just, I just want to clarify this little bit of confusion by going back to the runtime CPP file. If I can quickly get it up. And tick is actually calling, is returning get current time, as you can see here go ahead and run the UWP application and I'm going to step through um, the code base via debugging and after we've done that I'm going to quickly um, just discuss some of the debugging considerations that I believe are quite important um, to just again overall round your knowledge on this um, kind of functionality and some of the concepts behind what's happening uh, when we utilize manage and unmanage interop. So I'm going to go ahead and allow the program to build and run Okay, so the application is loading and uh, it's just basically a, um, a blank window because I haven't put any XAML on, on top. But what we're interested in is stepping in through the code to just kind of confirm that the C++ logic uh, in the Windows Runtime Component application, or rather project type, is actually being parsed.
So we're gonna go ahead and just wait a little bit for the application, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for the application to run. And as expected, generally as expected, um, the um, the debugger has stepped through the C++ logic. So it just literally took me straight to a break that I left in the C++ file. And what it's done, if we go to the, um, I think this is IntelliTrace, I'm not sure if, if that's the actual name, but I'm gonna see that we're computing elapsed seconds since I've already stepped through the code because I put the break at the uh, line uh, after the method has finished um, its processing. And we have a value for elapsed seconds and uh, we have all the other members here, which I can expose. So then we can confirm that um, our C++ logic has been parsed through our UWP application. And we're back in the UWP file. So um, what I'm going to do, just I nearly forgot, I'm going to expose, um, I'm going to expose this time class um, variable. I don't know how, oh goodness, that's really hard to see. So I'm gonna have to zoom in once again. I'm gonna expose this time class. I'm gonna expose the native view. And I digress somewhat, but I want to just draw your attention to this ABI reference count and um, this weak reference source. And I'm gonna use this as a little bit of, um, as a platform to just kind of talk about some of the debugging considerations that we want to have. Um, in this particular instance of the context of this example, you also ex you'll probably notice now that I've drawn your attention to. It, I'm just gonna move the screen. It also says, uh, "Where has it gone? No symbols loaded." I'm just gonna stretch that out a little bit. No symbols loaded for VCC. So that's uh, I believe that's VC Core Library there, and a, a little bit more data there. App .dll. So we're gonna dive into just a little bit. What are symbols? And uh, why is it important to understand symbols uh, within the realms of interoperability? And we're gonna look at some articles um, in order to um, base our learning on. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop this. So the first thing I wanna walk through and help to explain just a little bit, if I can just go up, is this, this topic. Now, what I wanna speak about it, a little bit is here. I'm going to zoom in on the text just a little bit. And I'm just going to briskly go through some of this article. So interrupt between C++, Win Runtime, uh, Windows Runtime, and the ABI. So this topic shows how to convert between SDK application binary interface, ABI, and C++ Win RT objects. So um, one thing to note is that we are working on uh, interoperability um, at a binary level. And the binary, the ABI basically um, allows, let me just highlight here, allows various programming languages to interact with an object, regardless of programming language. Client code interaction with a Windows runtime object happens at the lowest level with client language constructs translated into calls into the object's ABI. So I just wanted to just bring that to your attention as to what's going on when we actually work with a Windows Runtime component and the kind of level it goes to in order to make this for this level of interoperability achievable. I think it's also kind of important to at least consider strong and weak references in C++ because... Um, Again, my example is very, very simplistic, but as this particular article highlights, as you'll see in this topic, knowing how to manage these references, and that's referring to strong and weak references. Um, where was I? Knowing how to manage the strong and weak references correctly can mean the difference between a reliable system that runs smoothly and one that crashes unpredictably. So I thought I would just throw this in this video just so that I can give you a little bit of a head start if you want to do a bit of background reading into how to um, make um, efficient systems with this kind of approach. And there's some examples here that I found quite intriguing. I was going through, um, link to this in the description. So this is here for wider reading. And finally, I think it's also important, this is a Microsoft developer blog, I believe it is. 
Uh, but it's definitely, it's, it's just an article on the Microsoft Azure DevOps page. And in this particular article, it speaks about symbols. Now, I found this very intriguing because in this article, I'm going to zoom in just ever so slightly. If you don't know what symbols are, um, prior to this article, I be I will admit I, I knew of symbols, but I, I had a vague understanding as to what they were. But um, this really breaks it down very well, and it actually explains why, if you recall, if you rewind in the video um, where I showed you where it said in the debugger, um, sys um, symbols not loaded. This sort of seems to explain why. So symbols are a fundamental requirement for debugging and, and other diagnostic tools. Fortunately, in most cases, when you are building and launching your application in VS, Visual Studio, you don't have to think about symbols for your code. Usually, this is the case I find with um, like managed environments like C Sharp, uh, UWP, and WPF. However, the odds are that at some point in time, especially when you, as a C Sharp developer, if you are looking to take your, your tier of, of, of skill to the next level, you probably want to start approaching some of these concepts. However, the odds are that at some point in time, you will need to change how symbols load where the debugger looks for them, or we'll need to load symbols from a third-party component, for example, Windows or .NET libraries. So it goes on to explain the basics behind symbols. And... Um, a symbol is basically, I'll read it out, the exact context of symbol files will vary from language to language, and based on your compiler settings, explained at a high level, they are the record of how compilers, uh, how the compiler turns the source code, so the C sharp logic, C logic we write, into machine code that the processor executes. So with that being said, we can understand that symbols are quite important, quite, they are Im very important in order to parse um, for the machine code to be parsed by the processor, you could kind of consider it the bridge between the code we write uh, at the, in the IDE and the machine code that's executed by the processor itself. And why you need symbols, of course, as we kind of explored, we need symbols in order to parse the machine code. And so what I suspected why my symbols, uh, the fact that I, I, I was limited in what I could debug was because I had certain symbols missing because I didn't, should I say correctly, I didn't correctly um, configure my debugging session. And it even goes on to say in this article, the default behavior of Visual Studio's debugging. This is if you, you know, stock Visual Studio and you don't um, really configure the debugging settings. And I found this one quite, quite interesting. It actually says the exception, uh, let's actually read from here so it gives a bit more context. Visual Studio will try to load symbols for all binaries referred to as modules in the process when the module is loaded and for all modules already loaded when attaching to a process. The, ex the exception to this is when you are debugging managed.net applications, so UWP, WPF, the debugger will not load sys um, symbols for any binaries considered not your code when just my code is enabled. Again, uh, this is just to bring to your attention some of the theory that I find is quite um, useful in this particular context and how it can help us, help me, help you, if you're not already at this level, become even better um, .NET developers as we kind of um, enter the realms of not just C Sharp, but harnessing the prowess of unmanaged um, code in order to get more out of a modern framework, i.e. UWP, a, a modern programming language such as C Sharp, and really just get the most out of software development as a whole if, if one does choose to go the .NET route. So I just wanted to go through that. I hope I'm recording. I am. Thank goodness. Um, I just wanted to go through this topic. I hope you gain value in this. Uh, a little different to what I usually do. But I might go a little bit deeper into this kind of into this realm of backend uh, with regards to programming because I find it rather fascinating. Um, so that's all there is to this part of the walkthrough. I hope you have a great day. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.